One night, I got into an argument with my girlfriend and went back to my dorm room. I managed to catch the subway before it closed, then walked 200 shivering meters to the bus stop. The street light above wasn't working and there was no one around. I started wondering if the buses were still running when the approaching rumble and screech answered my question. The source of the noise rounded the corner, hesitated briefly, then opened its doors. You guys still operating? I asked the unshaven driver in his orange vest. Last bus, he grunted, tapping his fingers impatiently on his knee. I didn't bother him further, just exhaled with relief and stepped into the completely empty cabin. For some reason, the interior lights flickered occasionally, as if the bus itself was fighting to stay awake. I took one of the rearmost seats, I always liked watching the other passengers, how they were dressed, what they talked about, the expressions on their faces as they gazed out the windows, whether they smiled when meeting their own reflections eyes. I always smiled. The bus rumbled as it accelerated. It passed through a few stops without stopping since there was no one there anyway. At the next one, it paused to let on a hunched man in a black cloak with the collar turned up. He coughed as he boarded and took one of the front seats. I couldn't make out his face so I turned on my music player to avoid falling asleep. At the following stop, two more passengers got on a young guy in a dirty hooded sweatshirt and an elderly woman in a crimson cloak. Quite a beauty. She seemed to be returning from some upscale restaurant dripping in gold jewelry, a tiny purse dangling from her arm. Though a luxury car driven by a young lover would have suited her better. The woman took a single seat in the middle of the bus while the young man slouched into a double seat, resting his bulky backpack beside him and staring out the window. The bus started moving again. I glanced out the rear window at the tracks receding around the bend, illuminated by the streetlights and occasionally obscured by leafy trees. A black cat darted across them, its white tail tip glinting briefly. No one was at the next stop either, but as the bus prepared to continue on, a pale figure emerged from the shadows. It braked abruptly and opened the doors. I was nearly dozing off by then and barely registered the new passenger. Until I shot upright. Miss, what happened? She was drenched from head to toe. And nearly naked, wearing only a blood-soaked bath towel wrapped around her. That alone would have been shocking enough, but... The towel was almost completely saturated in blood, dyed a pale pink hue with darker crimson splotches where her hands clutched it. Her hands were also completely covered in blood. We need to call an ambulance. I rushed over and grabbed her cold hands. Deep gashes crisscrossed them, oozing sluggishly. I looked at her face, beautiful girl, but pale as a ghost with heavy dark circles underlining her wide, startled eyes as if surprised by my reaction. God, this is really bad. We've got to stop the bleeding, will someone please help me? I pleaded, scanning the bus, but none of the few passengers budged. The bus steadily accelerated, utterly unperturbed by the bleeding young woman seemingly on death's door. Frantically, I fumbled for my phone, no signal. Damn! Does anyone have a phone I can use? Please, someone give me their phone. I nearly shouted. Is this a dream? This can't be happening. Why won't you help me? The cloaked man merely hunched further, turning away. The guy clutched his backpack tighter and hid his face in his hands. Only the elderly woman stood, came over and took my hand, shaking her head and rasping in a throat-scratching voice. Son, you can't help her anymore. None of us, really. WH, what are you talking about? I stammered, flicking between the bloody towel and her placid expression. Slowly, she pulled aside her blouse collar. We're all dead here, I recoiled at the bruised black finger marks emblazoned on her neck, explaining her strangled rasp. Strange that a living boy could board this bus. Yes, the dying girl whispered, pulling free of my numb grasp. Very strange. Dazed, I turned toward the front passenger. He offered a bitter smile and indicated the small, singed bullet hole in his chest. His black cloak glistened not with fancy fabric but congealed blood coating the back. Nausea washed over me. I reached for the next stop request cord, desperate to escape. But the woman shook her head, resuming her seat. There's only one way off, son, the final stop. The conductor is the only one who can let you through those doors. A choked sob escaped me. On wobbly legs, I staggered back to the rear seats. My head swam, short of air. The blood-soaked girl pocketed two coins that fell when I grabbed her, settling onto a nearby bench. 
I couldn't bear looking toward her or the hooded teenager beside me whose depths seemed to glisten with some sickly shine. Oh God. The bus stopped again. A sobbing young woman in a hospital gown boarded, cradling a small bundle. Of course, the maternity ward stopped. I shuddered. Dread clenched my insides each time we decelerated, fearing some new nightmarish horror would join us. Death took so many forms. No, don't think about that. Or the final destination. Good job, driver. Last bus indeed. Despite my prayers, we did stop once more. The new passenger exchanged words with the driver, swiped through the turnstile, and entered the cabin. I couldn't discern his cause of death. Nor did he resemble the other dead riders. Tall and clad in a shadowy robe, the elderly, gray-haired man had pale, slender fingers. Piercing blue eyes. The disarming smile of a seasoned therapist. So this was the conductor. Pay your fares, he bellowed in a rich, ceremonial tone befitting a pastor. But, fair? The passengers began retrieving ancient, tarnished coins from their pockets just like the pair the bloody girl had dropped. The first was the man with the bullet wound. Handing his coins over, he forced a humorless smile and mumbled something. The conductor replied and the man's smile turned sincere. Obediently, he tilted back his head as the conductor placed the coins over his eyes. He went rigid. Moving on, the conductor approached the woman in the crimson cloak. She cackled hoarsely when he asked her something. I'm more worried about meeting my first husband again. That bastard surely won't be there, he has no place in heaven. The proper attitude, the conductor approved, laying coins over her makeup caked eyelids. Frozen with a smug grin, she looked quite satisfied. Next was the mother with her infant. She wailed as the conductor placed a pair of penny-sized coins over the tiny, unmoving eyes. But his words soon calmed her anguish. Tilting back her head, miniature discs now adorning her peaceful face, her arms remained cradling the swaddled bundle. When the hooded teen's turn came, I squeezed my eyes shut. Reopening them a moment later, a white silk scarf now draped his face as he too had stiffened. Thank God. Finally, it was the bloody girl's turn. After a hushed exchange, the conductor took one of her coins, catching my confused look. Just a down payment, he winked. She shuffled to the rear exit and pressed the button. The bus began decelerating. Now the conductor faced me. Lights flickered as all but two passengers were frozen with heads lolled back. My pulse slowed in time with the bus. What would become of me? You're a stowaway, it seems, the conductor noted. Boarded the wrong bus by mistake. I'll have to put you off. You can walk the rest of the way, not quite your stop yet. TH thank you, I stammered with relief. I was being released. The bus shuddered to a halt and the doors hissed open. The bloodied girl and I disembarked, but as soon as her feet hit the ground, she dissolved into a faintly glowing, translucent silhouette that dissipated seconds later. So that's what he meant by down payment, she was now just a spirit. I turned, hoping to express my gratitude to the conductor, but the space behind me was empty, only the fading rumble of the bus remaining. I walked home that night, hardly believing the experience was real while I awoke the next morning. A couple years passed and the journey faded into a vague recollection, eventually slipping my mind entirely. Until now, I'm 48 years old. After tucking my sons into bed and kissing my wife goodnight, I went to my study hoping to make progress on my new novel draft. But that evening, I never made it to my computer. There on my desk were two coins. Tarnished and ancient, just like on that bus years ago. I'm sitting on the patio recliner in our suburban backyard now. No bus service runs through this neighborhood. But I can hear its distant approach, growing ever nearer. My final bus is coming.